In this question, a 12-year-old boy is brought to the physician's office because of rust-colored urine. Rust-colored urine, that means there is blood in the urine. So blood, oops, <laughs> blood in urine. And look at the age. He's only 12 years old. That's very important. So there's 12-year-old boys brought to the physician's office because of rust-colored urine, facial swelling, vital signs, and physical exams show blood pressure of 150 over 90. Okay, so there's a little bit of blood pressure. For 12-year-old having a blood pressure, that's odd. And periorbital edema. So periorbital edema. Blood chemistry shows an elevated urea, nitrogen, and creatinine. So increased bun and increased creatinine. Urine analysis shows hematuria. We already talked about that, blood and urine, because this patient had rust-colored urine. They're repeating themselves. RBC casts. This is important. RBC casts. And 1 plus gram, 1 plus... Uh, 1 plus protein, which is 1 gram per day protein. So 1 gram per day protein loss. Protein loss. Which of the following is most likely diagnosis? This is a classical post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Okay? Because, first of all, uh, the, the boy is 12-year-old. In a 12-year-old boy, we usually... Uh, a boy about or a child about six to ten years around that age um, if they come with um, fever, malaise, nausea and dark urine I'm already thinking post streptococcal. The presentation is usually two to three weeks after the initial insult. The initial insult could be pharyngitis, it could be impetigo, anything, any strep infection. It's, this is going to happen two to three weeks after that initial insult. So we see blood in urine, and we only see one gram per day uh, protein loss, which tells me that this is not a nephrotic syndrome. This is not minimal change, which is also seen in young people. Usually, these kind of, uh, this kind of kidney problem is going to cause facial edema, periorbital edema. So we see that. There is also going to be a bit of hypertension, which is obvious. We've already looked at that. There is periorbital edema. That's also normal. They're also going to have a little bit of increased burn and creatinine. So everything, this is just, this is a typical, typical example of post streptococcal. What I wanted to talk about is RBC casts. RBC casts, when do we see RBC casts? We see RBC casts when there is uh, inflammation. And not only inflammation, this is also shows that this is intrarenal. Okay, intrarenal. We're only going to see RBC casts if it's inside the kidney itself. Not in the ureter, not in the bladder, in the kidney. So, which also tells me that this is post streptococcal because RBC casts are seen. Another area where we see RBC casts is going to be pyelonephritis, which, is, has, which has gone already to the kidney. So we're going to see RBC casts. So that is also typical. So now that we're so sure that this is a post streptococcal, let's talk about which of the following option kind of, um, you know, helps us pinpoint the correct uh, choice. So A is benign hematuria. Benign hematuria, this is not benign hematuria. So that's not the option we're looking for. Glomerulonephritis. See, this is misleading. They did not put post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. They only put glomerulonephritis. But we know that this is post-streptococcal. So this is a possible answer. We have to look at all the options. So you might have a better option than that, the one that's given. C. Nephrotic syndrome? Absolutely not. We already checked that out because of the protein, the amount of protein loss. Nephrolithiasis. Nephrolithiasis. What is nephrolithiasis, by the way? Whenever you have stone in the kidney, stone in the positioning of the renal system is going to give its name. If it's in the kidney, um, you're going to call it nephrolithiasis. If it is in the ureter, you're going to cause ure ureterolithiasis or something close to that. 
So this is a 12 year old boy. Chances of him having a kidney stone is much, much less. And also, yes, he can have inflammation because of it, but look at the overall signs. There is blood pressure, there is periorbital edema. You're not gonna have periorbital edema in a kidney stone. So this is non nephrolithiasis we can rule that out. Bladder cancer, we already talked about RBC casts coming from inside the kidney, so this is not bladder cancer either. So our choice is going to be B, glomerulonephritis. Now let's talk about some of the other options we have and discuss about them also because we talked about them a little bit. Okay, first of all, we have benign hematuria. Benign hematuria, this is an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern, okay? And we are going to see thinning of the glomerular basement membrane. There is also going to be normal renal function. This patient does not have normal renal function. Benign familial hematuria is an autosomal dominant inheritance, normal benign function. There is only thinning of the basement membrane. That is the only thing. So there's going to be thinning of basement membrane. That's option one. Option two, we already talked about. Option three, that's nephrotic syndrome. Lots of protein in the, in, the, in the urine. Now, what I want to talk about with nephrotic syndrome is that nephrotic syndrome is going to have lots of fat and almost no, you know, there is not going to be any casts, which tells me that there is no inflammation, right? Nephrotic syndrome does not have inflammation, and that's why we see no casts and only fat bodies, okay? Just wanted to kind of throw it out there. For, last of all, we have bladder cancer. So the thing that we see with bladder cancer is that we see painless hematuria. Now this is very important. Where else in the kidney system do we see painless hematuria? It's going to be the renal cell carcinoma. Very, very important. Painless hematuria, bladder cancer, or renal cell carcinoma. Okay, so now that we talked about it, I quickly want to talk about the, what we see in histology in post streptococcal. Now, histology of post streptococcal can be divided into three sections. There is the light microscopy, there is the electron microscopy, and immunofluorescence. Okay? All of them are very, very important. And they are very distinct. With light microscopy, what we're going to see is that, number one, we're going to see hypercellularity. Okay? Hypercellularity. And we see hypercellularity because of uh, infiltration of the neutrophils. So lots of neutrophils come, they pack the glomerulus, that's what we see. The hypercellularity is because of um, neutrophils um, that has come to the, to the glomerulus. What else do we see in the light microscope? As a result of the hypercellularity, the glomerulus is going to be enlarged. Okay? Enlarged glomerulus. And last of all, which is the most important, we are going to see the typical lumpy, bumpy appearance. Okay? Don't be fooled with the lumpy, bumpy all the time. Don't expect that to be just thrown in your face. Imagine what, how else they can describe lumpy, bumpy. There's going to be lumps or, you know, I don't know how they can say it, but imagine the, the look of it rather than the words. Yes, if they give you lumpy, bumpy, you're just lucky, but they might just describe lumpy, bumpy appearance. This is what we're going to see. See, the thing is, light, lumpy, bumpy, we're going to see it in light microscopy. Then what do we see in electron microscopy? Okay. Electron microscopy is going to show the subepithelial immune complex humps, which is causing the lumpy, bumpy appearance. Now, where is the epithelium? Please remind me one more time. Okay, so if this is the glomerulus, right? And this is the endothelium. The innermost corner is going to be the endothelium. After that, we have the basement membrane. And on top of the basement membrane, we have the epithelium. Okay, epithelium. And where are we going to see this lumpy bumpy appearance? What are they called? They're called subepithelial. So if this is epithelium, this is where the immune complex deposition is going to have subepithelial. And this subepithelial deposits is due to antigen antibody complex binding and depositing over there. The antigen against the because this this patient had this patient had uh, an insult two to three weeks back 
is there a strep throat an impetigo or something like that so those strep antigens are still present in the blood so the antibody against the strep is going to bind and they're going to deposit sub epithelial and this post tetraclocal glomerulonephritis this is an autoimmune disorder and this is clear with this uh, dep deposition of sub epithelial deposits so that's what we are going to see in um, immuno uh, sorry, in electron microscopy. Last of all, we have immunofluorescence. In immunofluorescence, we are going to see that there is going to be uh, granular deposition. Granular deposition. What does that mean? The thing is, remember good pasture? Good pasture is going to have linear deposition in the glomerular basement membrane. That's because basement membrane is everywhere, all along the cell lines. But immune complex deposition is, might not happen all over. It might happen in chunky blocks or blobs, right? So they, let's say they deposit here, a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here. That gives the appearance of, you know, granular. This is not, you know, they're not going to be all over. You know, yes, they are going to be all over, but little chunks here and there and here and there, wherever they want, it deposits. So that's why it's going to have a very granular appearance on electron microscopy. This deposition, this granular deposition is due to IgG, IgM, and C3. And that's why we're going to see decrease in C3 in, in a patient with post or after they have had post and this deposition happens in the glomerular basement membrane and in the mesangium. Where is the mesangium in the, in the glomerulus again? These are the areas where we have mesangium, right? They're going to deposit there. Last of all, in post what deposition are we going to see? Uh, sorry, what kind of antigens is going to be present in post There is going to be anti-streptolysine. O, there is going to be anti DNAs B antibody. Okay, so these are the, some of the things we're going to see in post post tryptococcal.